Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Intuitive Epidemiology. In this three-part video, we will discuss an issue known as the Table 2 fallacy. This is me. The seminal paper on this topic was published in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 2013 by Drs. Daniel Westreich and Sander Greenland. The full title of the paper is The Table 2 Fallacy, Presenting and Interpreting Confounder and Modifier Coefficients. The opening sentences of the abstract state, it is common to present multiple adjusted effect estimates from a single model in a single table. For example, a table might show odds ratios or risk ratios for one or more exposures and also for several confounders from a single logistic regression. The table two fallacy indicates that this can lead to mistaken interpretations of these estimates. In terms of setting the stage to discuss this paper, if you were to Google Table 2 fallacy, you would see the following article discussed in the fifth result. This article, or this unpublished commentary, was put out by Dr. E. Al Shahar, a retired epidemiology professor from the University of Arizona. And this commentary on the Table 2 fallacy paper is titled, a fallacious publication on the Table 2 fallacy. So in the Shahar commentary, he states that he agrees with the key messages of the Westreich and Greenland paper. So he agrees with the Table 2 fallacy concept. However, he states that this particular paper published in 2013 in the American Journal of Epidemiology does not provide sufficient background information for the paper's target audience where the paper's target audience is obviously people who are propagating or who are committing the Table 2 fallacy. So he highlights two potential types of readers. The first type of reader is somebody who understands the fundamentals of epidemiologic modeling. And in that case, the Table 2 fallacy is obvious and is already being avoided in their interpretation or in their own research. In which case, Shahar says that the Table 2 fallacy paper is in fact redundant for these readers. Then he identifies a second type of reader, reader B, who does not understand the fundamentals of epidemiologic modeling and therefore cannot understand the issues related to the fallacy. And he says in this case that the Table 2 fallacy paper is essentially unintelligible. In the Shahar commentary, he poses the question, does a journal publish an article, for example, does the American Journal of Epidemiology publish a Table 2 fallacy paper just to motivate a frustrated reader who cannot understand the paper to study the topic of the paper? He says he doubts this. While, the, while I do not necessarily agree with the tone of Shahar's critique, I tend to agree that the seminal paper by Westreich and Greenland, published in 2013, may in fact go over the heads of the paper's target audience. However, unlike Shahar, if you were to read his commentary, I do not necessarily fault the authors or the editor of the American Journal of Epidemiology for this. However, part one of this video series will attempt to bridge this gap by approaching the Table 2 fallacy concept from the ground up, starting at the basics of explanation or explanatory research in epidemiology. Before we talk about the Table 2 fallacy, it may be useful to start by describing what a Table 1 is typically in a paper. As shown here, a Table 1 is typically descriptive in nature, where we see the characteristics of the study sample, and these are often broken down or stratified by the exposure or the outcome variable. In the example on the right hand side, taken from one of my own papers, you can see the descriptive characteristics of people living with HIV, hepatitis C virus co-infection at their first point, time point in the analytical study sample. And we had broken this down by their food security status. 
which was the outcome in this particular analysis. Going back to previous videos in epidemiology, we can do description, prediction, as well as explanation. And in the context of explanation, we are look, typically looking at the relationship between a given exposure and an outcome variable. Very simply, epidemiology can be broken down to this two by two table concept or idea where we count and compare how many exposed people did or did not experience the outcome of interest and how many unexposed people did or did not experience the outcome under study. Please go back and watch previous videos on this channel if you'd like to explore this idea further. As previously discussed in past videos, we can estimate odds ratios or risk ratios, and these are estimates that quantify the relationship between our exposure of interest and our outcome. An odds ratio or a risk ratio of one indicates that the exposure has no impact on the occurrence of the outcome. An odds ratio or a risk ratio greater than one indicates that the exposure increases the likelihood of the outcome. And an odds ratio or a risk ratio less than one indicates that the exposure decreases the likelihood of the outcome occurring. We can calculate these by hand as shown here by using placeholders in the two by two table of A, B, C, and D. When thinking about estimating odds ratios or risk ratios, we have to think about the idea of a causal effect where in this case, that number, that measure of effect, represents a causal effect if we can then say that the exposure does in fact cause or prevent the outcome under study. Bias refers to any systematic error that results in a non-causal estimate, so a non-causal odds ratio or risk ratio or a risk difference. And it can be broadly broken down into information bias, selection bias, as well as confounding bias. And we will focus on confounding bias in this video series as it is highly relevant to the idea or the issue of the table two fallacy. And as you might imagine, causal inference is the process of quantifying unbiased measures of effect, such as odds ratios or risk ratios. As discussed in far greater detail in past videos, confounding is differences in the exposed and the unexposed groups beyond the exposure itself. And a confounder is a variable that represents the factor which differs between the exposed and the unexposed. One way you can think about this using this very simple diagram is that a confounding variable opens a backdoor path between the exposure and the outcome under study. In terms of epidemiologic study designs, we can use observational studies to estimate our odds ratios or our risk ratios. This may include cohort studies, case control studies, and cross-sectional studies. And in observational studies, we do not have the benefits of randomization, and we simply observe who is exposed versus who is unexposed. We will go back to a familiar example on this channel, where we look at the relationship between owning a fancy and expensive Rolex watch and its impact on mortality. As we know, owning this watch does not necessarily extend your life. So if we were to estimate a causal effect of Rolex watch ownership on mortality, you would expect to find an odds ratio or a risk ratio of one. However, we do know that ownership of a Rolex watch reflects a high socioeconomic status or SES. And SES does increase one's life expectancy or those two factors are strongly correlated. Therefore, SES will be higher in the exposed group who own a Rolex as compared to the unexposed group in this hypothetical observational study. In this case, as shown in the diagram, the relationship between watch ownership and mortality is confounded by socioeconomic status. So if we were to estimate the relationship between these two variables without considering confounding, we would have a biased association. In the case of randomization or experimental studies, where you randomly give half of your study participants a Rolex and the other half do not get it, you break the link between socioeconomic status and Rolex watches. 
In this case, SES is no longer associated with owning the watch or not because they were given out at random. Now the exposed and the unexposed groups, Rolex versus no Rolex, will be of equal SES, and SES can no longer confound the relationship under study. Randomization, if done well enough on enough people, facilitates RCTs or randomized controlled trials being atop the hierarchy of evidence. Because what randomization does is it automatically eliminates differences between your comparison groups. In this case, your exposed and your unexposed groups. In other words, after randomization, the group with a Rolex is, on average, the same as the group without a Rolex, with the exception of the Rolex watch itself. And this allows for fair or unconfounded comparisons between the exposed and the unexposed groups, in this case, in your experimental study. And this allows you to answer the question, regardless of SES, what is the impact of owning a Rolex watch on mortality? If we were to go back to our two by two table idea and our simple diagram, this is what were to happen if we were to ignore SES in our observational study or in our study where we do not randomize watch ownership. As we can see, this simple two by two table as shown here, where I put in placeholder numbers, does not account for the confounding variable. There's no consideration of SES in this simple two by two table. In terms of completing a hand calculation using these made up numbers, we could hand calculate an odds ratio of 0.71. This is less than one, indicating a protective effect of Rolex watch ownership on death. We could also hand calculate a risk ratio, getting a risk ratio of 0.8. Um, if you've taken epi classes before, you'll be able to tell me why those two numbers differ. But for the purpose of this video, the takeaway message is that if you hand calculate an unadjusted odds ratio or an unadjusted risk ratio using a two by two table, you will find a protective effect of Rolex watch ownership on mortality. It will prevent you or lower the likelihood of you passing away. And this is in an observational study where no randomization has taken place. Similarly, we could use a simple unadjusted or univariable statistical model to estimate these numbers, where our exposure variable is binary, where we have people coded as being exposed or having a Rolex versus unexposed or not having a Rolex. And we could use a given model to estimate odds ratios or risk ratios. We will not focus on the 95% confidence interval in this video. In this case, in a simple unadjusted model, you would estimate the same odds ratio or the same risk ratio, quantifying the relationship between owning a Rolex watch and mortality. But again, this univariable model ignores the impact of socioeconomic status and the role it is playing as a confounding variable. We can also take our hand calculation a step further. In this case, we can consider the confounding variable of SES, potentially coded as low versus high SES, by stratifying our two by two table. In other words, we can use two two by two tables to look at the relationship between watch ownership and mortality in the low SES stratum, as well as the high SES stratum. In this case, we could calculate odds ratios or again, risk ratios using each of these tables separately. In theory, you would find obviously fewer Rolex watch owners in the low SES group and more in the high SES group. But more importantly, among the low SES group, Rolex ownership will no longer be associated with mortality and similarly, in the high SES group, Rolex watch ownership will not be associated with mortality either. And this null effect or no relationship was not observed when we did not break down this two by two table by this confounding factor. As mentioned, if you calculate odds ratios, 
you would have two of them, one for the low SES group, one for the high SES group. Similarly, two risk ratios, one for each group. And you could combine them using something known as a mantle Hansel estimator. So essentially, you can take those two odds ratios or those two risk ratios, use this estimator, and get one of each measure of effect. In this case, you would have one odds ratio adjusted for socioeconomic status or one risk ratio adjusted for socioeconomic status. And in this case, in this hypothetical example, the odds ratio and the risk ratio after adjustment for this confounder would be equal to one. Similarly, in an adjusted model or a multivariable model, where now we have a variable for the exposure as well as the confounder, we could also estimate adjusted odds ratios or risk ratios, which are now equal to one, reflecting a causal effect or no relationship between owning this watch and mortality. And this is the same answer we got from the Mantle Hansel adjusted estimates from the two by two table. The key message here is that we're using this multivariable model to adjust for a particular form of bias that we identified based on our conceptual framework in that small diagram on the right hand side. As a recap, explanation in epidemiology involves looking at exposures and outcomes. We can use stratified two by two tables or multivariable models to estimate unbiased or adjusted measures of effect. In this case, we're mitigating confounding bias by considering these extraneous variables. And the amount of bias in our study dictates how useful a finding is for decision making. In other words, does the odds ratio or the risk ratio reflect any meaningful truth? An unbiased odds ratio or risk ratio indicates a causal effect. Minimally biased is a reliable association. And strongly biased is an unreliable association, where we actually do not know what the impact of the exposure is on the outcome or we're not confident in making any conclusions based on our study. Again, wrong answers can be shown here. Biased answers, where we ignore SES in our first two by two table in our hand calculations or in our unadjusted univariable model. As shown, the odds ratio of 0.71 or the risk ratio of 0.8 indicating protective effects of Rolex watch ownership on mortality are both unadjusted and they do not reflect the truth. Both the table and the univariable or the unadjusted model indicate that Rolex watches decrease one's likelihood of death. Similarly, decisions that relate to the provision of Rolex watches to decrease mortality would be based on biased evidence it would not have an intended impact on mortality. So the takeaway is that the estimation of meaningful causal effects, in this case, you can replace the word causal with meaningful, requires that all confounders be measured and adjusted for in the observational analysis. And while this is a very difficult task, one must at least try. Just a quick side point, why do we use models as opposed to hand calculations or two by two tables? As you can imagine, hand calculations become difficult when we have more than one confounder. This would lead to many stratified two by two tables. It's also less clear or less simple to do hand calculations with continuous or non-categorical variables. And obviously it's much slower to do this Importantly, hand calculations are unable to handle certain complexities, which I'll talk about below. In terms of models, we can easily include many confounders at once using multivariable modeling. We can estimate measures of variance quite easily in the form of 95% confidence intervals. We can account for longitudinal data, so data collected over time. We can also easily transform variables and so on. Importantly, with models, we can general, generalize to many forms of outcomes. So linear regression for continuous outcomes, Cox proportional hazards models for time to event analysis, logistic regression 
for binary outcomes, and so on. Now I want to begin introducing uh, another example related to my own work that I will use to further illustrate or set the stage for the table two fallacy. And that is the example of the relationship between injection drug use as a behavior and food insecurity as an outcome variable. Now our exposed group is those who engage in injection drug use as compared to those who do not. And our outcome is food insecurity as compared to not experiencing food insecurity. And an unadjusted or univariable model, you would have one variable indicating yes to IDU versus no. And clearly neither of these examples account for confounding variables as only one independent variable, in this case, the exposure is considered. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the typical table two in an epidemiologic study. The second table in a paper is typically the multivariable model, which shows you the relationship or the measures of effect for the exposure outcome relationship. And this model is typically adjusted for various confounding factors. In this case, the exposure shown in this table two is injection drug use. We estimate adjusted risk ratios and we show the adjusted risk ratios for all the confounding factors that are included in this multivariable adjusted model, which is indeed shown in my papers, table two. The parts that I blocked out are just another model which represents a different coding of the exposure variable. But in order to simplify this example, I've blocked those out here. Simply, if we were to show what this model is looking at diagrammatically, we have the exposure of injection drug use, the outcome of food insecurity, and a variety of socioeconomic, sociodemographic, behavioral, and clinical confounding factors that we adjusted for in our multivariable model in order to mitigate the bias, specifically the confounding bias, due to these factors when looking at the relationship between our exposure of interest and our outcome. So this is a typical table two in a scientific epidemiological study. And obviously this table is what we will use as an example when discussing the table two fallacy. Coming full circle, this is the paper that we will dive into in the next two videos where the fallacy relates to presenting multiple adjusted effect estimates from a single model in a single table which is indeed what was done in the last figure. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching this introductory video to the table two fallacy. Please subscribe to this channel if you find this content interesting. And of course, leave questions or comments below if you think that I missed anything. The second part of this video series is linked immediately on the left where we will indeed dive in to the intricacies and the issues related to the table two fallacy.